All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Drug Courts, A Bridge to Recovery. We're pleased that you're joining us today. Um, the first drug court was established in Miami, Florida in 1989, and as of 2015, there were more than 3,000 drug courts across the country. Drug courts are recognized as an, an effective intervention for justice-involved persons with substance use-related problems. Um, today's webinar has the following learning objectives. We want you to know about drug courts, about what drug courts are and how they were developed. We'll learn a bit about the history of drug courts and what it entails to start a drug court and some of the challenges that drug courts face. Our presenters will also share some personal stories about the effectiveness of using drug courts as a bridge to recovery. I'm your host, Susan Halpin. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the New England region of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. My office is located at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to thank the Gladys E. Kelly Public Library for allowing us to present this webinar to you today from their beautiful space. Um, this webinar is being recorded. You'll receive a link to the recording um, and all of the presentation materials and any resources we mention um, about a week after the webinar is over. Um, the, if you require captioning for today, um, I had put the um, captioning link in the chat box for you. You can click on that. So this webinar will last about 45 minutes. If you have questions about what you're seeing or hearing, jot down your questions and we'll save the last 10 to 15 minutes as a time for you to ask questions. For those of you not familiar with the National Library of Medicine, I want to just briefly ex um, exchange, I'm sorry, explain its mission, the resources, and um, our outreach program. So the National Library of Medicine, or NLM, is a physical library that's located on the campus of the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. It's the largest biomedical library in the world and one of the federal government's largest providers of digital content. All of the information from the NLM is available online and can be accessed by anyone. There's no cost to use any of our online resources, databases, tools, or websites. And the mission of the NLM is to advance the progress of medicine and improve public health by making health and medical information accessible to everyone. The NLM carries out its mission through a national network that has about 7,000 members across the United States. This webinar is being organized through the New England region. There are seven other regions across the country that provide similar outreach through online um, training um, and grant funding. Those who use our resources come from many different backgrounds and professions. Um, for example, those registered for this webinar are librarians, healthcare providers, public health professionals, educators, students, researchers, first responders, and members of the general public. Last year, about 77,000 people were trained um, through the NLM. We have a vast um, amount of information about how to prevent and treat substance use disorder, and again, you'll receive this information with the recording link. We also have um, a, um, a book club um, lending program for those located in New England. Um, you can learn more about this program using the link on the bottom of the slide or 
the name of my colleague, um, Sarah Levin Letterer, um, for more information about that. All right, now I'm going to turn this presentation over to Judge Tim Bebo, who presides over the Dudley, Massachusetts Drug Court, which was the first drug court established in Worcester County. I'm also pleased to have two graduates from Judge Bebo's Drug Court, Shenandoah, who I apologize, I spelled his name incorrectly, and Kayla. Mm -hmm. um, both have graciously offered to share their experiences with us so we can understand the personal side of this bridge to recovery. So I'm going to turn the laptop over and give you control. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, as Susan just said, my name is Tim Bebo. I have uh, been the presiding judge in Dudley for about eight years now. Uh, but it might be helpful to know just a thumbnail sketch about what my background was. I was a career prosecutor for 28 years. I, I ran the gang units and the drug units. So uh, I was kind of involved in the trenches uh, since my beginning uh, days as a prosecutor. I was appointed to the bench in 2010. Uh, what was painfully obvious to me is that what we had been doing in terms of trying to uh, treat offenders had not been working. I think that we had, had to come out of the, the dark and realize that the substance use disorder is, is not a, a criminal justice issue, but a uh, public health issue. And uh, what we tried to do in, in evaluating the needs in, in, in this jurisdiction is uh, how can we best serve the folks that we're seeing on a daily basis. Uh, Dudley is right near the Connecticut border. It's a mix of rural and urban, so we see a little bit of everything. Uh, tremendous problems with the opiate uh, crisis or epidemic, I just, as a uh, clever way you want to call it. So what we had to do is evaluate uh, the needs uh, for the folks that we were going to service. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a simple message, a, a drug court is really intensive probation. 90% uh, of the people that we see in our drug court have failed probation numerous times. So what we've tried to do is con configure a treatment or a modality of treatment that best fits them. Uh, as we talked about earlier, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a trained physician. I'm not a clinician. Uh, you know, I was trained. I went to law school. I didn't go to med school. So I think the first thing that we had to do was realize that, you know, we can't try to make decisions that we're not educated to make. So we had to assemble a team, a team that was really trained and best suited to address the needs of my population. So we, we partnered up with a local small hospital. We trained our probation officers. Um, my probation officers are in 24-7 contact with uh, the clinicians. So we created a team that would best address the needs of, of the folks that, that we had. Uh, most of our offenders are uh, you know, as I stated, it had failed probation. Uh, they're failing probation because maybe we weren't doing the right thing for them. So every person that wants to go to drug court gets a medical, bio, psychosocial uh, assessment. I listen to the drug doctors and the treatment providers as to what I see as, as their needs, and we incorporate those uh, needs into the probation. Uh, it's, it's intensive. I mean, some of these uh, probationers are, are on probation for relatively minor offenses, but they like the, uh, the structure, they like the services they're getting. Uh, you know, we keep it pretty simple. We, we ask them to trust us. We ask them to put their faith in us. Uh, we promise them that we will work as hard as humanly possible to create a plan that works for them. If it's not working, we have to change it. So uh, it's a very fluid relationship. Uh, you know, you, it, it'd be real easy for me to uh, sit here and, and, and preach or lecture all day, but I'm not going to do it because I really feel that, you know, the best people uh, are the, 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 those who have gone through the program itself. Uh, we have found that, you know, we've had 54 graduates in our five-year program. I think three or four have reoffended. Those are really good numbers, uh, really good numbers in, in, in this demographic. Um, and, you know, what we preach also is that when you graduate or when probation ends, you know, I don't think our job ends. I feel that we have to establish relationships and maintain those relationships. The two people sitting next to me, Kayla and Shenandoah, uh, have both graduated, have both finished their probation successfully. 
but they both come back to, to continue to give back to, to those in the program so that they can best be, uh, you know, giving back, which is really the best way to, to address the, the needs of uh, the folks that are in our drug court. Uh, and to say if it reduces crime, of course it reduces crime. If it reduces crime, you're saving the taxpayers money because it costs, you know, $38,000, I believe, to incarcerate somebody. Uh, incarcerating somebody doesn't cure an addiction. I think if anything that has been banged over our heads from, from day one is that, uh, you know, you can't just throw someone in jail and say they're going to come out cured. It doesn't happen. Uh, the recidivism rate is, is through the roof. So what we have to do is try to come up with something that uh, changed the, uh, the paradigm. And uh, it's, it's a work in progress. I mean, for me to sit here and tell you that I have all the answers, I don't. But I know what has worked for us. Uh, I know what uh, the investment takes. I don't think you can put dollar amounts on, on, on uh, this epidemic. But uh, I do know that you can't put a price tag on hope. You can't put a price tag on compassion. You can't put a price tag on the energy that, that this team uh, gives me on a daily basis. And uh, so what we have to do is, you know, com continue to modify and, and, and model our drug court up pursuant to the best practices. And, uh, and we also, which we might do a little bit differently, is that, you know, we expect some bumps in a row. No one goes through this program smoothly or without a hiccup, uh, that's part of the disease. And I think as we become more educated as to the disease of addiction, we can better understand, uh, you know, the shoes that Shenandoah wears and the shoes that Kayla wears. Um, uh, and again, I think that's really going to be important uh, coming from them as to, uh, you know, what works for them, how they feel emboldened by the, the treatment that they receive. And more importantly, the relationships that they made so that they've come full circle where they're actually giving back. So at this point, I'm going to have Kayla just step in and say, you know, just, you know, what has really been effective for you in, uh, in going forward. Hi, my name's Kayla. Um, I've been through the court system quite a few times. Um, didn't really work for me in the beginning. Um, until I got, you know, ready and willing to um, start my recovery. Um, best thing that happened to me was drug court. Um, Naomi is more, is someone that I look up to, is somebody who I admire, and along with everybody else in the court system, um, very blessed to be a part of it and to give back and I'm very blessed to, you know, be here today. Great. Thank you, Kale. Uh, Naomi is, is her probation officer and in a drug court situation, you're not you know, you're not meeting with your probation officer once a month or once every six weeks. You, know, you might be talking to them three or four times a week. Uh, so in terms of the intensity of the probation, that's probably one of the biggest things that that we're not used to. I think Shenandoah can, can reiterate, Shenandoah's probation officer is Rosemary Ford. And, and Rosemary, again, and Rosemary and Naomi have been uh, probation officers for about five years, but they're completely dedicated to the treatment modality. And, uh, and again, we, we talk not just like, you know, probation officer and judge, but we are part of the team. So if, you know, if, if they see something that might need to be changed, then we change it. And, and it's not just sobriety. We look at employment, we look at education, we look at re reunification with family members. And I'm going to have Shenandoah just talk a little bit about his relationship with the system and what changes he has seen from the time that he's been in the drug court as well. Hi, I'm Shenandoah. Um, I've been, uh, I was a repeat offender. I've uh, been in and out of jail since I was 17 years old. Uh, on probation about eight or nine times. Um, nothing ever worked for me. I uh, 
it's kind of just like a revolving door. I'd get into jail, I'd go to work release, make some money, get out and buy drugs and alcohol and go right back to what I was doing before I went to jail. Um, up until uh, the opportunity of attending drug court, I had never really, I had always uh, vilified the whole system. I vilified everything from law enforcement to uh, basically the judge sitting up there with his gavel and his robes. Um, what drug court did for me is it actually humanized the process. It humanized the judge, it humanized the law enforcement agencies, and it made me understand that they weren't necessarily people that were out to get me and out to incarcerate me. More or less, there are people that are trying to help me uh, better myself and uh, not continue to become incarcerated and not continue to go back out and do drugs and drink alcohol, you know? Um, I think drug court was one of the better experiences of my life. Um, the opportunity that opportunities that were uh, presented to me upon beginning and throughout the process of drug court were were innumerable. Um, I now actually actually have my family back. I uh, I've been clean and sober for quite some time. I attend NA and AA meetings uh, almost every day, and uh, you know I I haven't. I haven't even thought about committing a crime or doing anything wrong in quite some time. And I, I owe that to drug court. If, if I hadn't attended drug court, like I said, I would still be vilifying the whole system as a whole. And uh, that's about all. Thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, what we, it's, a, it's an education process for all of us. Uh, you know, it, it, I think Shenandoah hit it right on the nail is that, you got the person sitting up on the bench in their robe, and, and they think they might have the answers. Well, we don't have the answers. Uh, and uh, in fact, when when we run drug court, I don't even wear a robe. I mean, I think they have to see me face to face for what I am, which is a, a flawed human being. I'm no different than uh, anybody else. And and if we're to think ourselves as being any different, then we're we're fooling ourselves. So uh, you know what we try to do is. When we assemble the team, we use as many community partners as possible. Uh, the, we, we are in a jurisdiction where transportation is an issue. So our transportation is, a lot of those needs are, are taken care of by the sheriff. The sheriff of Worcester County has a van and he gets people to, the, to our drug court, uh, you know, to, to work sites. Uh, employment is a huge component, you know, getting people to work, getting them feeling good about themselves, getting them supporting themselves, school. You know, I'll, I'll embarrass Kay, Kayla, but she's going back to school and she wants to be a, a, a clinician who works with folks with a substance use disorder. That is, is how I measure success. Uh, as I stated earlier on, I mean, I was a uh, prosecutor for so many years, and, and, and when you're uh, in those, when you're in the trenches, you see the, the everyday nitty gritty, and, and when you get frustrated when you know that it's not working. Typical day in a drug court, we try to meet, uh, in the beginning we would meet every single Wednesday. We'd meet for the first hour with the team. The team would uh, consist of the defense file, the prosecutor, the clinicians, myself, um, the folks from the sheriff, all the treatment providers. So we would take part and we would discuss, uh, you know, the issues surrounding each individual. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? What can be changed? What are they doing for work? What's the home life situation? Uh, you know, are they hungry? You know, very basic questions that we have to uh, fulfill relative to each uh, client. Uh, now, while, we, while the team is meeting, I know Kayla actually runs a group for the folks that are in the drug court presently. So they're getting assistance while, you know, we're trying to figure out what best to do uh, for each individual. Then in the, the actual drug court takes place, I'll stand in front of them and we try to, you know, do four to five, six minutes for each person. I have to be versed in everything that's going on in that person's life. So again, I can address uh, questions, I can address needs, I can address uh, any uh, issues within the team that maybe we can help, maybe we're doing something wrong. Uh, to say that you can put every probationer in a box and say, if we do A, B, C, and D, this is gonna work, that's a fallacy, okay? Every person's different, everybody's road to recovery is different, so what we have to do is respect that and, and utilize every single resource that we have. Uh, to that end, I mean, I can't say enough about 
Harrington Hospital, which is a small local hospital, which has um, been with us full throttle right from the beginning. Uh, you know, probation without uh, a probation department that really wants to work above and beyond the normal call of duty. I mean, these people aren't getting overtime pay. They're, they're working 24-7, you know, really assessing the needs of, of their clients. And uh, Again, it's, it's easy for me to stand there as the, you know, the de facto head of the drug court and, and say that we've done some good things, but you know, it's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with the team that's assembled and getting them to buy in. I think the, you know, the one thing that I preach is honesty. I mean, you have to be honest and you have to communicate uh, with us. Uh, I mean, if you're not honest, and, and we can kind of see through that pretty quickly. Uh, uh, and when you can do that, if you can come in there and look me in the eye and say, you know what, I'm struggling, fine, then we have to do something different. Uh, it's a very, like I said in the beginning, it's fluid. I don't know everything that I'm going to confront when I go out in the court that day and start the, the, the actual drug court session, okay? If there are instances where someone has really fallen and we have to hold them for a day or two uh, so that we can reassess and get reevaluated, we will do that. Uh, we're not going to throw you in jail for 40 days just to, to think about it. That doesn't work. Treatment is the main goal. Getting you back into treatment is the biggest, you know, uh, goal that we have to seek on a, on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, when we talk about skills and talents, uh, again, like I said, I'm not sure you can put a price tag on hard work. You can't put a price tag on uh, instilling hope in people. Uh, and to be able to go above and beyond and, and, and do anything extra, uh, those are the people that make up this team. And, and uh, you know, without those partners, I mean, we, we would really struggle because, you know, when we try to make a def definition of su success, I don't look at it as just someone who has graduated the program and, and uh, you know, you have, you know, one year of, of you're clean and sober. It's way more than that. Success right now is Caitlin St. George sitting next to me, knowing that she's going to be going to school and, and uh and you know, obviously, she comes back on a weekly basis to give back to the to the people that that we feel need help right now. That is success. Uh, what does the data show? The data shows that we've graduated 54 kids, and hopefully, out of those 54 kids, their lives have been changed significantly. Uh, I know I see we hear from many of them. We see many of them. I was just invited to two different weddings with uh, kids who had drug court uh, for the first class of my drug court graduates. That is how I determine success. Uh, sometimes you can't put everything, is not just a numbers game, uh, particularly having been in this system for so long. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier to quantify success as, you know, seeing where these people are going with their lives. Kayla raising two beautiful daughters, Shenandoah raising a beautiful son. Uh, that, to me, determines success. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I think sometimes you get too caught up with numbers. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, I'm not only technologically inept, but I'm, uh, I'm not a great numbers guy. Uh, I think I'm a pretty good human being person, and, and to see people coming back and giving back, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer support is, is, is massive in, in someone's recovery. Um, and so what we've tried to do is go past the hurdles, stay on an evidence-based uh, treatment protocol, which is suggested by the clinicians and the doctors, uh, again, I can't, so I can't prescribe Suboxone or Naltrexone or Vivitrol. I let all the medical decisions be made by medical people. Uh, I just stay with in, in my own lane and, and do what I can do from the legal standpoint. Uh, are there people who are leery of drug courts? Sure. I mean, everybody's rights have to be protected. And I think, you know, my idea from the get-go is to get the defense bar involved as much as humanly possible. So the defense bar has a seat at the table. Nobody goes in front of me uh, in a drug court without being represented. No one enters a drug court without being represented and, and fully apprised of exactly what's going to uh, be required of them. So we make certain that you know everyone's rights uh, uh, respected and everybody has representation. Uh, if there's a, a bump in the road, you get representation so that you know, any decisions that are being made by a probation or a drug court client are being made with the assistance of 
council and uh, you know the information that we utilize in, in the team meetings they utilize for the treatment protocol only that's it so uh, you know no one's uh, none of the information that's that's shared is, is being used for anything but the well-being of, of the clinician of the uh, probationer uh, and I'll be honest with you in the you know I'm going on six years we have never had one issue with anything and, and I think some of our greatest successes have been uh, probationers who you know have completed the program and have remained sober and working and, and viable members of the community but those some of those cases were the easiest decision would have been give them two years in the house of correction and then we go back into the spin cycle so we've taken chances with individuals uh, and and even if you don't graduate we have seen people with significant uh, Time frames of sobriety, and again, they're not reoffending. So, uh, my attitude is is that someone learns from from every single uh, stretch of sobriety that they have, and that they can then learn that they can fall back and rely upon people such as Shenandoah and Kingla. Uh, so it's not just the court system; it's it's you know living a life that you can reach out to someone that that, that you know has been successful and you know has. Uh, Set off that success in the past. All right. Maybe could you tell your your story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in May of May seventh, two thousand fourteen, I had my first child, and um, it wasn't the best uh, birth. So I ended up getting addicted to opiates after having her and um, so getting off of those was very hard for me and um, it just led me into other things. Um, I come from a family of addiction. Um, my dad's an addict and uh, he's actually in recovery right now but um, I've always been around that. Um, after having my daughter and being in pain and everything like that, I became addicted to opiates and I, you know, chose other things um, to fulfill my needs. But I also, you know, lost my family, a relationship of 13 years and um, but not. But as I look back on everything, you know, it made me who I am today. Um, during this recovery, you know, I found myself most importantly, um, and it didn't happen right away, that's for sure. Um, when I first got into probation, I was on the run for for a while. Um, and what really hit me when I came back was, you know, they were more surprised. They, they told me that they were more, they looked in the paper every day to see my name because they were just afraid that, you know, I was never going to show up or, I wasn't going to make it. Um, that that really hit home when a place that you're so scared of, you think that they're just going to throw you right in jail, and they're just so blessed that you're alive, and they're so happy to see you. And you know, hitting rock bottom was definitely the biggest part in my life. Um, just having nothing, having no family, having no supporters. Um, my biggest support was the court system. Um, to this day, I, I think of them as family. I don't even think of them as, you know, a probation officer or anything. They're, they're people who I hold close to my heart. Um, it's been a rocky, it was rocky in the beginning because not only um, did I go to jail for not a long period of time, but you know, I lost my daughter, and um, that's probably probably what made me realize, you know, okay, Kayla, it's not about you anymore. It's about your children. So I was very stubborn and um, very hard to work with in the beginning. So I was very blessed to get with um, the probation officer that I did have. Um, I always call her a little pit bull because she definitely nipped me in the butt to get going and to know that I was, you know, that I can get through this. Um, 
and most importantly during all this whole recovery was finding myself. Um, not many people, you know, put their needs first and that's something that I had to do not only for myself but for my children. Um, I've come a long way. Um, not only did I want to do this for myself, but I wanted to help other people as well. Um, when you lose your children and stuff like that, it's very hard um, to forgive yourself. So that's why I wanted to start the drug court group because it's, I wanted to let people know that they are not alone. Um, it was very um, closed off before uh, when I was in drug court. So to have this group and to uh, get to know everyone and to just know that they're not alone and that the recovery does matter. Um, a lot of people, like uh, Judge Bebo said, you know, flip up because I was one of them. You know, it didn't take me, it wasn't the first time that I stepped into the court and in drug court that I, you know, got it right away because that's definitely not what I did. Um, but when I did, um, you know, hit rock bottom, I went far and I've never failed a test. I've never, um, you know, I didn't lie about things. I was open and honest even when I was scared to. Um, I was very happy um, with what I was given and blessed for what I have. Even to this day, I, I've had, I went from having absolutely nothing to even having my own apartment and uh, my children, both my children in my life. Um, so yeah, I am so blessed in many ways. And even with Shenandoah, I've learned so much and grown so much from him and so many other people. And it's from Dudley Court. I mean, I would never in a million years think that I would even say this, but if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and I would love to give back and I hope other people who, you know, go through this, they get strong enough where they can get back and we can get over this epidemic because um, we're losing so many people and um, it's heartbreaking. It really is. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah. Shenandoah, can hmm. you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, sure. Uh, I started drinking around the age of 12, um, started doing drugs around 14, 15 years old. Um, I got uh, heavily into opiates around 7, 16, 17 years old. And uh, my life was basically a revolving door of the streets and jail and uh, detoxes and uh, basically went on like that. I'm, I'm 39 now. Um, at the end, at the end, just before drug court, I was living under a bridge in Worcester. Uh, I had lived under a bridge for about three years. Um, I was doing about five grams a day of heroin and drinking about uh, three pints of alcohol a day of cheap vodka. Um, and I was I was basically hopeless at the end there. I was uh, I I had no faith whatsoever in myself. Um, the only thing that really saved me was being given a chance on drug court really what saved my life. I was I ended up sitting in jail for about six months before I ended up starting drug court. So I kinda got to get my feet underneath me before I before I started. But uh basically uh my life is infinitely better. I uh had my four year old son in my life, um as well as his mother and um I actually uh, woke up in a home instead of under a bridge, you know, this morning. Um, I'm just thankful that there is a process like drug court that uh, gave me a chance to uh, to try to do the right thing, you know, instead of just putting me in jail and, you know, that's a wrap. That's that's it. This uh, is my previous experience with, with uh, 
the judicial system was they just put me in jail every time, you know. Um, so I have a question. So what what do you do if you have no home, no job? Like, where do you start and you're involved with drug court? Like, the support? They'll help um, you with housing. They'll, they'll help you with housing. Can they'll you help tell you with... a little bit about, like, what they did for you? I, I had a home. I, I had a yeah. home to go back to. But as far as I know, they help with – they help in – the sheriff's office is a huge uh, – Huge uh, over the bridge, bridge for people because they help with employment, they help with GED, they help uh, with housing, they they uh, they help help me with transportation. I don't have a car, so they help me get to and from drug tests and to and from drug court, and uh, basically, I, they're, they're, they told me that. If I had anything, no matter what it was, no matter how big or how small, to just ask, and uh, that's where a lot of the trust came came into play. Was uh, that I was? And I mean, to be honest, you know, it's not all drug court. I got to be. I got. I had to be willing to meet them halfway, you know. But they definitely they jumped through hurdles for me. I can't. I can't even begin to. Uh, to, to express my gratitude and the things that they did for me. Um, I'm a musician and I had no guitar. They actually got me a guitar, which is really cool. <laughs> and uh, one of one of the judges donated a guitar to me, and uh, they've they've helped me. They've just helped me in a lot of ways. So that's basically. I know that if someone is homeless, that they'll they'll do it no matter. They'll do everything within their power to, to help that person. So that, that's one of our biggest jobs, quite honestly, is we're on the phones with the shelters, the halfway houses, the sober houses every day. I mean, we're either looking for detox beds, CSS beds, or you know, longer-term beds. So, and uh, again, that's where I tip my hat to the folks that are part of the team. But again, if you don't have safe you know, housing, you know, you, you're putting yourself behind the eight ball right off the bat. Uh, Shenandoah's needs were taken care of at the beginning, and, you know, we were thrilled when Kayla got out of her apartment. So uh, you watch the progression, uh, and like I stated before, how it was fluid. Having Kayla come in and run a group prior to uh, the actual drug court is something that I envisioned five, six, seven, eight, nine years down the road when you can become more seamless as a recovery community. Uh, but she saw a need, she jumped in and did it. I mean, so that's why, you know, are we willing to accept suggestions and offers and, and anything to make the program better? Absolutely. Anything that, in my mind, that, that will enhance the recovery process, we will do. So uh, I think that's a perfect example of us kind of molding uh, our mission towards uh, the needs of, of the folks. And, and for her to give back is, is, is heartwarming. And, you know, the only thing I think what we, these guys have probably heard it from me as well is that you know, we've talked about, you know, we're not going to work harder than you so that, you know, you have to trust us, you have to uh, be honest with us, but you also have to meet us in terms of working. So I can't have my probation officer giving it 80 percent if you're giving it 20 percent so that we have to rise them up so that we can do it cooperatively. And, uh, you know, they can give all the praise they want, but they made a complete commitment in terms of the re their recovery and how, how hard they were working as well. And it's a testament that, you know, when you finish probation or you finish, say, drug court, uh, you're gone, okay? I haven't heard in my 30 years of this criminal justice system of people coming back when they finished the probation and wanting to give back. That's something that I didn't expect. I just figured we could do the program, throw the best that we could uh, at everybody, but for them to come back and, and want to help out, again, I think that defines success a little bit. You can't quantify it, but you can certainly, uh, it's a telling effect. When Caleb takes someone who's brand new with the drug court, or Shenandoah reaches out and sees someone in need, and now that they can talk with someone who's actually walked through the process, that gives us instant credibility, and it gives the, the, the new drug court candidate 
a chance to hear it from someone other than, you know, the judge or law enforcement or probation. Let them hear it from someone who's benefited. And, you know, I think we do things a little bit different sometimes. Uh, but, you know, the, the mistakes that we're going to make is, are going to be mistakes of commission. We're going to try something versus mistakes of omission, uh, you know, what if. Uh, you know, Shannon Barrow has been to a lot of wakes. I've been to a lot of wakes. Uh, I'm sure Kayla has. We've lost people that were in the drug court. Uh, it, quite honestly, it beats you up. And, and But that's what drives us as well is, is, is when you see the successes. So that's a, a big part of what we're trying to, trying to do. And, and it's complete, constantly evolving, constantly evolving. Uh, meeting the needs of the people who need you, yes. Um, so you know what? Yes, I I think at this point um, you may have some questions. Why don't we open it up to um, the audience? And if you could type your questions in the chat box. Let me get this open. So while we're waiting for people to type in their questions, how do you work it with um, people who do have jobs and, you know, have to make counseling, um, you yeah. know, appointments as part of their That's easy. commitment? Uh, you know, we, we work our schedule around theirs. So, uh, you know, you can be tested as early as 6.30 in the morning at the sheriff. So, uh, you know, another issue is that we were so close to the Connecticut border that you know, that people have to cross the lines to work. We make it work and we really encourage uh, them to be open with us as we can't, you know, we can't read minds. So let us know what the issues are. I'm having trouble making this test or I'm having trouble doing this. Then we just adapt it so that it works, particularly when people get more involved with, with work and, and uh, with, with schooling. So we want to make sure that all of that, all of those needs get, get taken care of. Okay, so I see a question here. Are there drug court programs in other Massachusetts courts? And I don't know if you could um, sure. explain, you know, sure. about starting one. Right. Uh, it was funny. I, I started it just because I, I we had the need, and, and I met with Harrington, and they said, uh, uh, what do you want to do? I said, we'll start it, and then what date? I said, how about June 1st? He said, well, why June 1st? I said, well, it's my wedding anniversary. It's a good day. And we did. We just made a decision, and we just did it, and, and we have not stopped. We haven't looked back. Uh, the Commonwealth and Governor Baker and Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Plato are committed to specialty courts. Uh, they hope to open up, I believe, 12 and 14 this year alone, which is incredible. Uh, and that's, you know, if I can help out any of my colleagues and, you know, what has worked for us. And, and every jurisdiction needs a different as well. You know, you might have an urban one versus a, uh, you know, more rural like we are. So. So, and there are over 20 other yes. drug, yep. drug courts. Okay. Um, so here's another question. Um, Hi, Judge. Can you touch a bit upon Section 35? How Section 35 might um, play into the overall success rate? Sure. Uh, Section 35, in a nutshell, is when uh, a loved one. Uh, I'll give you an example. Say if you know if, if I thought my son was uh, abusing a uh, controlled substance or alcohol, if I felt that he or she was at risk of harm to herself or others, I would petition the court for a Section 35 commitment, which is a civil commitment. What that means is that the person we brought in, uh, interviewed, evaluated by a, a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist might say that this person meets the criteria, and they would go to uh, a treatment facility. It's using the average span is 15 to 20 days. They come out of that with a game plan as to uh, what the further treatment should be. But what Section 35 does is it takes the person from who's at real risk right now and gets them into some help so that they can be detoxed and at least be put in a position where they can make clearer and better decisions. Okay. Um. We have a lot of questions, so let's see. Um. Uh, 
All right. Does, does the drug court determine what treatments people get? Are all effective um, options available? Do people with opioid use disorder have access to medication treatment? Great question. Uh, when we first started, uh, the medically assisted treatment component was not, you know, it was, it was part of the process, but uh, it was very much 12-step oriented. I mean, I, I know we started from the get-go. We, our motto was to throw everything we possibly could at it. But again, I don't determine the treatment. It comes from a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says that this person is good for a, a suboxone induction. I, I go strictly with what the medical profession say, but we embrace it. We embrace it, absolutely. Okay. Use properly, it can be a, a, a lifesaver. When you are involved in drug court, do you also live at a detox facility? What kind of stabilization do you have for living instead of being incarcerated? We probably have five people in drug court presently who are in residential homes. We get probably three times a week updates. They have to be tested. Uh, you know, if we can find a safe uh, home environment for those folks, again, that's if that's part of the recovery. We're not going to be, we're not going to put ourselves in the middle of that. You know, a, a safe, sober living environment, uh, you know, is, is is goes a long way towards someone's meaningful recovery. Right. So someone, um, um, someone messaged me privately, but I think this is a a valid question. Do you think a partnership with a community college would be helpful? I mean, could you see that working? Yeah, Kayla might be a way into that. I mean, I definitely want to be involved in stuff, and I think, you know, the more you go further in recovery, the more you just want to help and the more you want to be involved. So, yeah, I, I absolutely okay. think that that would be yeah, wonderful. I would think community college yeah. in Southridge is used by a lot of our folks. Yeah, and, and, ad care. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they they have programs too where if you want to be committed into this or, you know, either want to be, um, like what I want to do as substance abuse counselor, they have opportunities where they give you internships and, mm -hmm. you know, they work with you one-on-one -on -one before you make that commitment. Okay. How does a person get referred to drug court? I work in an area. Oh, sorry, this was private, but I'm going to continue. I work in an area where there is a drug court, so I'm not clear how a person receiving services um, from an agency could would become involved with a drug court. I'll be, I can see it. Uh, it's a gut. I live in. A, I, we work in a small court where it's pretty much just myself, so I can tell right off the bat if, if someone's a good drug court candidate, and I'll have them talk with probation. The key with, with someone going to the drug court is they have to want it. I can't stuff it down their throat. So we have a whole process where they actually, I want them to sit in the drug court and see, and I'll question them. I mean, do you feel that you can give us the commitment that, that you see here today? And most of them say yes. But uh, uh, again, I've been doing this a long time. You have an instinct. A lot of times, these folks on probation can get off probation with a fine but they like the structure, they like the way their lives are going, they like the fact that they're part of a process that's, that's successful. And, uh, and again, I, we say no to nobody. I, if someone wants help, we're going to give them help. And if we don't fit all their needs, we'll find a way that, that we can. So someone, again, this is a, a, a message to me, but um, I think this is a great question. As a librarian, I would like to offer programs for people who are attending our local drug court, things like musical entertainment in a safe, drug-free environment, exercise programs, art classes, speakers, meditation. Do you have suggestions for how libraries can best support and provide programming for drug courts? Well, we're sitting, that's we're awesome. sitting on it's been fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the more community partnerships you have, and the fact that we're sitting in this brand new building that they offered right. up to us to do this today, uh, yeah, and we've got the music, and we've got, right. I mean, to me, folks like Shenandoah, you know, I, I think the, the message gets skewed sometimes that we get inspired by them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just natural. 
so that, you know, it's not just us up here saying do this, do this, do that. I mean, you get tremendous fulfillment as a, as a judge. I know I can speak for my team members when we see that. And the more that the community gets involved, yeah, that's, that's how we, that's how you break down this, this hysteria and the stigma that, that has attached uh, to folks with substance use disorders. Uh, and, and we've made progress, but we need to go an awful lot further. And it's something like this where, you know what, I mean, if I knew Shenandoah was playing here at five tonight, I mean, I'd be the first one here, and I think right. half the courthouse would be. Right. So that's what, yeah, I think that's phenomenal. So do you think, is there, is there, um, we're going to give you all resources if you want um, more information, but do you know where people would go if they're not from Massachusetts, but to find out where drug courts are in yeah, there? Yeah, just the, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they're fabulous. I mean, okay. They, I mean, they, they want to, probably the best training. There might be 10,000 people there each summer. But it's, it's throughout the country. Uh, some states have more resources or have dedicated more resources. But you also look at the problem is different, where we might be dealing with a real opiate issue now. You go further west, it's more methamphetamine. So it changes with the, with the, the landscape. So again, I think what we have to be vigilant is to constantly be aware of, of what services our people need so that we're not duplicating or, or going far afield. But the National Association of Drug Court Professionals is a fabulous uh, resource. Okay, and our question here is, are there any other U.S. states that have similar drug court programs? And yeah. I, I actually did find, um, I can add this to our resources, but it was, it was um, from the Obama administration actually had um, anyway, um, there there was a plan to have drug courts extend into every state in the country, and um, it's where it's going. I mean, I think we we've, right. we've got to realize that uh, you know you have to treat an addiction. You can't incarcerate away an addiction. I mean, it's you have to look at uh, you know. Look at the numbers for the past 50 years. You don't have to be a scientist to figure that out. All right. Um, I'm just seeing if I missed anybody else's questions. You know, I think we've covered all of the questions. I don't know if um, either of you have anything else you want to add. I guess one of my questions is the people who come to your weekly group, is it held at the courthouse? Yes. And um, what do you see as like the biggest need for people who attend your group? Is it, you know, the support or is it the how many people come? Well, it's um, we've definitely made it more mandatory now um, since we started it. So while they're in their meeting from one to two, uh, we meet in courtroom one for the same amount of time from one to two, and we just bring up topics that you know um, that best help each other, and because um, you know there's always new people starting. So we also try to make it fun too, like, um, and you know, we always want to make sure that everyone knows that it's a safe environment, that whatever they tell us, you know, we're not going to run back and tell the judge or, you know, their probation officers. Um, it's just something that we want them to be comfortable and, you know, open up to us and to, you know, discuss things with us that they can't, you know, discuss with other people, or even just an insight on, you know, what we've been through, you know, to help them push through along. Um, I think it's wonderful that, you know, it's mandatory now because in the end it just gets better and everyone, you know, knows each other too now, so it's less you know, intimidating going into the courtroom um, because 
you know, sometimes it can be when you get called up by yourself and stuff like that. I, I always let people know that, you know, if they want me to go up there with them or, you know, need help to advocate for themselves, then I would, you know, we're right there for them. Great, thank you. All right. Um, so, um, we still have five minutes. If anyone else has another question, feel free to type it in. I'm going to put the, um, the evaluation link in the chat box for you, but if, if you are getting um, CE credits for this webinar, you will need to fill out an evaluation. Um, even if you aren't um, getting CE credits, we really value your feedback and would love to hear um, you know, if this was helpful for you. All right, I'm working on the evaluation link for you guys. Thank you very much for joining us today. I especially want to thank Shenandoah and Kayla. Um, they took time out of their day to um, actually join us and, you know, sharing um, your story is not always easy. So I very much appreciate their help in educating all of us. And you know what, I am putting the link in the chat box, just bear with me. And the code is sub3brid. All right, everyone, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.